welcome to Diversitas, a podcast at the crossroads of diversity, business, and culture. Today, we have Dr. Clayton Coleman, who is the Director of Curriculum Design for the Arts and Sciences Online Learning Team at Penn, which is a mouthful. Um, Dr. Coleman, welcome today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on this podcast with you. Oh, and, and we're excited to have you. We wanted to talk to you about a number of things. First of all, I, I would be remiss to, to tell the audience that you have a PhD in English from the University of Delaware um, and that it, you use that in your day-to-day -day, um, position uh, as Director of Cur Curriculum Design. Tell us about that position. Tell us about what you do there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the Director of Curriculum Design is a position that has at least three parts of kind of many subdivided parts. One of them is working with faculty to imagine what types of courses um, and goals that they might have for students across different disciplines. Um, so I work, for example, with people in neuroscience as well as creative writing to build out their curricular spaces, right? Um, I also, as another part of this particular uh, position, I teach. So I get to teach in the undergraduate space, in the graduate space, and the high school space, because we have a high school program um, oh. at the liberal and professional studies. So I get to see it across the entire pipeline. Um, and then the other portion of my position is research. So I get to look into what innovative or other practices that are happening that are coming down the pike when it comes to teaching and learning, but also some of the other research that I was trained in with my degree in English, which I try to kind of build into pretty much all the work that I do um, in this position and also outside of it. So how long have you been at, at Penn? Yeah, yeah. So this is going into my seventh year wow. at Penn. Yeah, I started off uh, as an instructional designer um, and I did a lot of work one-on-one -on -one with faculty trying to figure out how they can transition some of the, the course spaces that they might have had in face-to-face -face environments into the online environments, um, trying to figure out what would work for them, what wouldn't necessarily work for them, and some of the affordances or challenges that they might run into in that new space, that new modality. So um, it started off there, and then it kind of bubbled up and extended and expanded over time. So the thing about the thing about this program that I like so much is that you when you say stuff, I don't I, you know, I may have a script in front of me, but I, I can, can choose not to follow it. Yep. <laughs> and I'm choosing not to follow it at this moment because there is a question that I had about because you, you know, in terms of um, education, university education, you have to have been at the forefront of trying to change university instruction on the fly during COVID. Yeah. So tell us about that. Ooh. What had like how did how did COVID affect what you were doing? Um, and then how did you have to change what you were doing to accommodate uh yeah. COVID? I appreciate this question. Um so yes, because we're an online learning team many of the different practices and policies that were coming during COVID, they kind of turned to us and other people who are like us in the space in order to figure out what practices would be useful on the fly, as you said, but also something that is durable, right? Like, so something that isn't just a one and done thing, but can help develop forms of meaningful connection and engagement um, with faculty members who never thought that they would be teaching online, who mm -hmm. didn't like online spaces, mm -hmm. uh, and also with students who never had to experience that environment before, mm -hmm. right? So some of this the things- a, It's a very different yeah. environment mm -hmm. to try to learn online as opposed to learn in a classroom, right? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, and this may be my bias, I say that it opens up a lot more opportunities for people okay. um, in that space. And part of the reason why so, I say that is because yeah. of the the space that we're in now, like I, I mentioned before, working for the College of Liberal Professional Studies, it's one of the kind of lifelong learning arms of Penn, right? So it's the students who may not be traditional students who are not 18 to 21 years old, though they are reflected in our student population. It's more the students who may be 35, 45, 55, 65, mm -hmm. who have a host of experiences, who may have had some experience in educational environments before, may not. Um, but what they bring to the table is that they can speak to 
real world examples of some of the conversations that we have, whether it's in business, whether it's in kind of connections to sociology or issues that they might be kind of engaging with, with any difficulties they have with diversity and their mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the materials that are assigned in the classes, but those lived realities and circumstances that people bring to the space that they learn from too. So that's why I say it's an opportunity. Oftentimes it's people who would never consider themselves as people who would be in pen. Um, and it opens up a door for different types of dialogue and pushes faculty members sometimes to change their approach, which mm. I think is the beautiful thing. Um, so I think that that's part of what grew out of the pandemic too, is that it forced a lot of people to change our orientation to what we expected for teaching and learning environments. And it got us to start asking different questions about what our goals were in those mm -hmm. environments too. So they couldn't mm -hmm. just be disconnected or theoretical. They were responding to the practical realities of people. Yeah, it's, it's in interesting sick, because you know? I guess you 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 would have like if you've been a professor of history for you know twenty years or whatever the case may be, and you have your way of doing things, right? You, you yeah, all of your outlines are done. You basically are on automatic pilot. You come in, you give your lectures. You know, you have your exams, you, you grade your exams, and and that, and that's pretty much it every semester. What, but with this, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that that professor had to really revisit how to teach a class, mm -hmm. right? It's not just how to teach a class in this virtual environment, but it really, you know, you have to take a step back and say, how am I teaching this class? How do I need to teach this class now? Yeah. Which, which means you have to revisit the whole thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you revisit the questions, that, like foundational questions that are tied to why you're doing it in the first place, mm. right? Especially in a discipline like history, for example, the ways that we have an understanding of how social formations are constructed, right? Throughout history shifts when we have to move into a non-physical, face uh, non-face-to-face -face environment because it changes our orientation to how we build out connections to people mm. or how we build out systems and structures that will allow us to have meaningful communication with other people or how we build trust when we can't put a hand on someone or shake their hand, right? Those types of things are important to consider. And it also forces us to reckon with the reality that we can't go back to what was before right. because that world does not exist anymore, right? right? So it's something that has to be a change that is not only one that we continue to revisit, but also one that we continue to encounter in different ways as we kind of navigate different si sides of our does, lives. Does does it make it easier? Do you, uh, uh, let me ask it a different way. Yeah. Are you, is the university, uh, is the university, is your division and your university benefiting more from diverse audiences in the post-COVID reality that we live in as opposed to pre-COVID because mm. of because of the um the virtual nature of pedagogy. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um so it was already pretty diverse before COVID. I think where the diversity comes in now is a diversity of intellectual approach or orientation, mm -hmm. right? So it's a diversity of thought. Um, whereas, Flesh that out for me. Mm -hmm, yeah, I think oftentimes when we talk about diversity, we talk about forms of identity, understandably, right? So we talk about race, we talk about ethnicity, sometimes we talk about um, sexuality, sometimes we talk about gender. What we don't always talk about, but I think is sometimes equally important, is the way that we orient ourselves to problems and situations intellectually, whatever our perspective, perspectives rather. What stories do we tell ourselves about ourselves and each other? What ways or relationships do we have with difference, right? And how do we how do we articulate those things and build out bridges between people when we may have different backgrounds, but because we grew up in the same class, for example, we may think pretty similarly, right? And there may be connections across that right. where you may see people who may look different, but they think differently. And vice versa, right? right? Who look the same, but they think differently. Right. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that are important and one of the things that we've noticed across time with this. So, And that's what makes it, for me at least, as an educator and also as an educator who talks to other educators, really interesting. Because you can't assume 
you can't assume what people bring to the table when you have these types of classes because Could of the you range before or was it not a yeah. consideration did it did it not matter yeah so i think that well I don't think that you could have assumed before, but now you really can't because it's so because it's so well reflected in the population at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. People who would have been like, I don't know about that online thing um, who would have had uh, affinity for face to face spaces are like, OK, so I've had a taste of this thing. I'm willing to take another step forward in order to try out something that might not have otherwise. Right. I might have right. only had examples of teaching and learning experiences that were on campus or that were in a traditional classroom. But because I've had so much proximity to or so much experience with working in these online environments through Zoom like this or through other platforms, I think I'm willing to try it out. And I think that that opens up the opportunity for, for more conversation for sure. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about your um, some of your research interests. And the one that kind of really popped out to me was Afrofuturism. Yeah. And when I think of Afrofuturism, you know, candidly, I think of like, you know, Parliament Funkadelic. Yeah. I think of, you know, stuff along those, like Sun Ra. I think, of, you know, I think of music. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it, clearly it's a broad topic. Mm -hmm. So kind of def define for us this broad topic and then Tell me kind of where you enter into it, right? Where do, yeah. where does your research enter enter into it? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, so yes, it's most certainly a, a broad topic. Some people will argue that it's an umbrella under which a lot of different types of engagement comes, right? So of course there's Parliament Funkadelic, there's Sun Ra for sure. Um, there are people like Janelle Monet, who a lot of people know. Yes. Um, there's also Black Panther that we know about, right? Like yes. that's it because it's gained mainstream success where you can have people who have connections to it who might not before. It's also sometimes the ways that we orient ourselves to the world in general, right? What we imagine for our future, what types of practical considerations that we make on a day-to-day -to, -day to figure out if we can see ourselves in a particular position in an organization, or if we can see ourselves building out a space for people who might not have had that space before in organizations too. Or other so spaces. is that for futurism aspirational? I think I think life is aspirational <laughs> okay. at this point. I think if if we look, say, for example, around us and the things that are going on in the larger world, right, and the social systems that we have, right, we have to aspire to to think that we could have a reality outside of our everyday today in order for us to keep doing the things that we did or do um, in our organizations. We have to think that things can be better for us in the long run if we're going to keep doing the things that we do. And we see people doing that all the time. In terms of Afrofuturism, it focuses on kind of a history of Black diasporic culture that is not only, some people say, it, it in some ways focuses on the U.S., but it, it's largely diasporic where you can have examples of that too. And other offshoots and connections to it, like African futurism and, and other things mm -hmm. like that of speculative fiction that allow for people to start to imagine what it might look like and then take practical steps towards is, that. Would, is Black science fiction necessarily a part of that that discussion yeah by definition I, I think i think so i think it's part of the discussion I'm asking, i don't know yeah 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 for sure i think it, i think it's definitely part of the discussion part of the reason i keep looking down is because I'm, i have this book here called viral justice by ruha benjamin right um and it talks and it speaks to certain aspects of afrofuturism through like how we understand the medical field or how we understand types of disciplines that we think about every day. So making it something that takes it out of kind of this theoretical space into the practical realities. And that's where I see my connection to Afrofuturism, right? So I got a background behind me that's Star Trek, right? Which is right. science fiction. Which is why, I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's, that's part of it. That's how I got into it, right? Thinking about, okay, so we don't only have to live by the constraints that we have now on this planet. We can imagine something different. We can imagine approaches that account for different forms of relation that we don't see now, but that we might aspire to in the future and that we might take steps towards. Um, so when I watched Star Trek when I was younger, that's one of the, some of the questions that I asked about. Um, and this is the original series. There's also other Star Trek series where you see like mm -hmm. LeVar Burton, for example, yes, in there. Right. I wanted to be an engineer. I didn't know what that meant. But 
I said to myself, because I saw LeVar Burton on this thing, I could be a spaceship engineer if I wanted right, to. Right, right, you right. You know, right, and you can make right, those right. arguments about how we see ourselves within society based on some of the things that we see in Afrofuturism. But it doesn't only have to be something, as you mentioned, that's aspirational. Um, there are plenty of scholars and, and folk who are organizers and people who are community connected folk who talk about the everyday science fiction of living as a non white person in society where you have to navigate systems that were literally not designed for you to exist, mm -hmm. where you have to kind of shift your reality or shift your presentation in order to kind of meet the needs or the expectations in those spaces mm -hmm. in order for you to kind of get the buy-in and forms of trust for those spaces to change over time. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is a kind of science fictional act, right? You create a mythology, you create a narrative around yourself, you align that with a narrative that you want to see, and then you take steps to build that out with strategies that are meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the, how I see Afrofuturism. Um, and I also, too, know that there are conversations that people have about, like, it being utopic or being something. Well, that was my not, next yeah. question, because mm -hmm. it, do, it does sound, it. the word that came to mind for me was utopia, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so, like, even if you look, you'll go back to the Star Trek example, the fact that you had people of different you know, races in the broad term races, right? That's just human races yeah. and other types of races. Um, creeds, colors, all kind of working together on the same mission, mm -hmm. you know, all of that, right? Um, it, it, it speaks to an idealized version of society. So, you know, that we don't necessarily find ourselves in some places i don't want to sound too pessimistic but yeah. you know as a as a general rule we still got a ways to go as Absolutely. it relates to that right yeah 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 i agree um and i think that, that is some of the most consistent critique when it comes to afrofuturism it's like we're dealing with reality right now people have hard circumstances people have life affirming or life altering decisions that they have to make every day and sometimes people say we can't afford utopia right now. We got to live in the moment. We got to live mm -hmm. in what, what we need. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I consider that, I hear that for sure. Um, and, you know, I grew up in West Philly. I know that all things are not beautiful all the time. Right. Um, and that you have to account for the environment that you're in, the context that you're in. And at the same time, I think that there are conversations about what folk talk about in response to that. Um, so there's this uh, scholar, Tress McMillan Cottom. She's a sociologist. She does public work. She works with organizations as well um, and has across organizations. She talks about this concept of pragmatic hope, right? Where you have this idea and she says this and I'll never forget it. She says, you may not see the good ends of your good deeds, but you do them anyway. Right. Some people might see that as utopic. But Cornell West was the same person. He, yeah. he talked yeah. about that a lot. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be able to <laughs> yeah, think outside of the curtain. Now, <laughs> yeah. You have to be able to think about the realities of where you want to be mm -hmm. in order for you to make that a possibility. Um, because you have to develop a lexicon around it. You have to develop strategies around it. You have to well, develop you know, that, a practice. And that too. was that goes to my next question, which is yeah. that is is Afro Afrofuturism a lens by which to interrogate? Or is Afrofuturism uh, something to be interrogated? Yeah. Or or both. Yeah. Like we're we're you know it, it sounds to me like it's something to be interrogated as opposed to a lens to interrogate. Yeah, that's a good distinction. I think I think it's definitely both, right? In terms of a lens to interrogate, I think what it does, and I've mentioned before that intellectual diversity piece. What it does is what it it makes room for people who have different orientations to problems to try to solve them, right? And to figure out a language that does that's not delimited by what people see as an immediate outcome mm -hmm. or that's not delimited by only what has happened before and what we know exactly works before, but which anticipates that we could have problems that we've never seen. We can have realities that we might not have even imagined before, that we have to have diverse forms of approaches to, en to enable forms of solutions for that. And mm -hmm. that taps into the reality that what we have to do is complex. No matter if it seems like we should have an easy solution, 
we cannot when we have a diverse a range of people who have different orientations to how they see problems being solved, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in terms of a lens for work, I think Afrofuturism gives people the ability to see that there's not only one way to approach mm -hmm. it. And also too, that those ways of approaching a thing should be looked at from the lens of interdependence, mm -hmm. right? So we're not people on an island. We, mm -hmm. can, we can't look at it from the perspective of individualism or individualistic approaches because we live in dynamic interconnected systems, right? And I think that that gives us that lens along with some other stuff that's embedded and connected to that too. So sure. as you were saying that, um, again, the 2020 came to mind mm -hmm. and the fact that that was, you know, that was some dystopian S H, you know what I'm yes. saying? Like that yeah. was dystopian, right? Yeah. The 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 week after when everything had closed down and we're walking the streets and everybody has masks on, mm -hmm. and you're walking into the middle of the street to avoid interacting with somebody, and the stores are there's a rush on the stores, and there's I mean it's just crazy. Now, why do I say that? I say that because it the if you look at what was happening in popular culture and if you look at what was happening in the news, it's kind of the opposite of what you would want to happen, right? Yeah. Um, where there was even more um, separation, more cleaving um, to, to things that are more comfortable to us and for us, yeah. to the detriment or potential detriment of others who are not like us, who don't look like us, who don't yeah. think like us, who don't act like the us, et cetera. Right. I mean, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's real. I think, hmm, unfortunately, when we have narratives about who we are and when we have systems that support certain relationships to the shared good society that say that what we should do is get ours before we worried about everybody else mm -hmm. consistently. I think that when you are in a crisis, that becomes exacerbated. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a foundation of solidarity, which we could, and in certain instances and in certain communities we do, and there are examples of this historically and sociolo sociologically, what happens is because we don't have a structure or a social system that seems like it trusts us to support each other, we don't trust us to support mm. each other mm. or ourselves. And so what we do is we collapse our unit. We try to protect the borders around us, mm -hmm. whether they're social borders or neighborhood borders or whatever it mm -hmm. is. Um, and or not national necessarily, borders. Or, how about that? National borders as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily see it as an opportunity to develop a different relationship with those systems that are starting to fall apart or to develop some sort of response to the reality of those systems. I will say, because I read a lot of science fiction, I knew, or at least I assumed that certain things would happen in the ways that they have, because mm -hmm. people have been telling us this mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And this is why when people say, you know, science fiction is that stuff that you read and it's no, divorced man, from reality. It's, 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 it's real. <laughs> it's like, what? I read this in a book 15 years ago and yeah. it's happening. As a matter of fact, funny that you should mention it. There's a book that we're, I'm teaching in a class now. It's a graduate class on organizational dynamics. We just got finished reading an economics book. Um, and we started making a transition into science fiction because that's how my brain works. And I'm right. encouraging people to kind of make different connections, right? Mm -hmm. So we're reading a, a book from Octavia Butler. It's called mm -hmm. Parable of the Sower. Mm -hmm. um, and they're getting into conversations about what happens when you start to have social safety nets or, or social connections start to break down. Mm. What does that look like? What expressions do you see in small groups and large groups? How do organizations respond to that? How does leadership either coalesce around solutions that would support or uplift people or make out their own spaces and carve out their own spaces where they can be protected and allow things to degrade over time, right? Um, and these are organizational considerations. These are also right. larger societal considerations. And part of the conversations that people are having in this class, and also we see because of the research outside of it, is that when you have these exercises and spaces where people can kind of talk about their experiences with things like 2020 or things before 2020, um, or they can talk about some of their fears or talk about how their reaction 
are emotionally to these types of things. You give them the potential to use that as a model for tools outside of it, right? So that's how I set up not only Afrofuturism, but science fiction and other speculative thought more broadly. There's also conversations now um, covering out of, coming out of spaces like the Stanford um, Innovation Review and the Harvard Business Review about science fictional thinking that leaders can use in order to anticipate some of the challenges or at least to try out solutions to challenges that may be coming down, whether it's related mm. to climate change, mm. whether it's related to environmental social governance structures, mm -hmm. all those different types of things, trying to figure out how we wed this speculative conversation with the reality of the data and the research that exists now in order to create solutions that actually speak to our now and our future, for sure. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to change topics a little bit that, yeah. um, because as you were talking, you know, you, you made several references to you kind of being into science fiction. I'm assuming you watch science fiction movies as well. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite science fiction movie? Ooh. Of all time. Ooh. Favorite science fiction movie of all time. Dang. So on, man. I, all right, all right, all right. I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna go with a recent one. Okay. Because I think it's it'll be a conversation thing. Actually, I'm gonna do a two-part answer because it's I'm, you know, stubborn. Um, so the first one is arrival. Okay. Where you have the aliens come and we have to kind of come together and try to communicate. Communicate, yeah. I remember mm -hmm. that movie. I think uh, that's who was the uh who was the uh primary lead there? In that in that movie. Oh, what was the name? I'm I'm blanking on the name, but I it's do a remember his name, right? Mm -hmm. It's a woman, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was name. great. Amy. Um. All right, never mind. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the reasons why I like it is because it talks about how we make conversations and communication and, and yeah, translate our perspectives across right. different cultures, right? Across the world. The globe. Right. It forced us to kind of have conversations as a global entity, as opposed right. to kind of like yes. the, the factions that we have. Well, so, you know, it's interesting because at the same time that there was um, <clears throat> kind of a divide along cultural lines and racial lines, et cetera, I, I would be remiss if I didn't also say that our larger organizations, despite our 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 country's leadership, despite our country's mm -hmm. leadership, mm -hmm. did come together, yeah, to figure out how to respond to this international crisis. So it's not like it doesn't happen or it didn't mm -hmm. happen. I should say in that particular yeah. context and environment, right? Yeah, um, and I I think you're right about that. And again, it took those multiple intelligences, right? Because some of us had a relationship to language that had one aspect to it, like one dimension right. to it. It forced us, and this is part of the reason why I like Star Trek and other ones too, um, it, it's forced us to think multidimensionally, okay. right? Because, you know, you have a narrative, and I don't want to give too much away for people who haven't seen it. I'm going to give some away though. You have a narrative that is about language, but it's also about time, right? right? How we orient ourselves to relationships over time. Right. And how time determines what types of things that we can imagine and what types of things that we can create and the language that grows out of it, right? So you have different types of people who have different relationships. So, okay, when I'm when I say this thing, I have words in my language for this, but I don't have words in my language for this. Or my language is more sonic based. Right. Um, and I can based on intonation and all the other stuff that I have to use as a as a kind of intellectual exercise in order for me to understand the multifaceted nature of that alien language too. Can I too. ask a, a real quick yeah. question because I'm old and it's in my mind right now and I don't want to forget it. Has anyone done an, a, an academic um, interrogation uh, uh, of Miles Morales and um, the Spider-Verse? Ooh, yeah. well... <laughs> there's ongoing yeah for sure there's ongoing conversations about well fandom um what fans of a specific uh cultural phenomenon will accept and what, what fans won't uh -huh. there's a larger interrogation about how we understand the demographics of people who are into comic books or that particular series 
and to, and to speculative fiction and all the rest too. Because the thing that we haven't necessarily talked about is that science fiction has been in the domain of white men for a very long time. Oh yes, right? no question. And that is similar in the comic verse, right? And the comic yes, sphere. absolutely. So you run up against that all the time where people feel a visceral connection to maintaining a yes. relationship to whiteness, to masculinity, yes. Yes. through these expressions of their mythology that they think are important, yes. right? And when you yes. have characters that butt up against that, you have all different types of cultural conversations that come out too, right. that speaks to the core of other conversations that are happening outside of you, it. You know, what's interesting about that though, and, and I don't know, um, but it seems to me that because they didn't try to make Peter Parker black, Mm -hmm. Right. They came up with a new character yeah. who had his own um, origin story, et cetera, that the to the extent that there was kind of outrage or opposition or whatever, it, it wouldn't have been as pronounced as yeah. if they would have tried to make Peter Parker into a, a black a Latino, a black mm -hmm. Latino in this case. Does that yeah. make, I mean, am I am I off? Am I on? What do so you think? The the funny thing is that there is another example that's in comics that we can use to kind of test your point, right? Like to to talk specifically to it. Uh -huh. There was um a person who was taking the place in some ways of Iron Man. It was a, a black woman, a genius, who was kind of in some ways kind of a protege type figure to Iron Man. Okay. Um, because to Tony Stark. To Tony Stark. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um up for, right? Like how dare you? <laughs> you know, th those types of things. Not only is it an, a, a white male, but it's a rich, multi, like, yeah, like a person like who has different type of... Multi-billion yeah. dollar playboy, mm -hmm. brainiac, handsome. Yeah. You know, yeah. yes. All right. different types of capital. Yes. Yep. That. Yes. And I think what that those conversations force are how we imagine our myths, right? What do our myths say about us? And what room is afforded to or not afforded to having alternative myths that would have us have different relationships with each other, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that too, and I'm really glad you asked this question because it, it gets back to the conversation about narratives um, and the things that my training has helped me to see over time. Like, not only close reading texts like the book that I have here, but close reading social situations and people, right? How do we do that in such a way where we start to tease out some of the realities that are embedded in the myths that we take for granted? We say like, oh, those Marvel characters are just, you know, for play. They're just for kids. They're just for, you know, box office hits and all the rest of that stuff. No, they speak to very real realities of who yes. we want to kind of construct ourselves to be. Yes. And also to what we see as possible right. for ourselves. Right? right. Same thing for the Star Wars franchise. Same thing for a host of other franchises that we have. Well, we you're think. obviously a yeah. Star Wars uh, fan. Also, so yeah. did you like the newest cast of Star Wars? I mean, I think. Well, I have a larger conversation. I mean, Star, about, Star Trek. I'm sorry. Star yeah, Trek. yeah. I like the newest cast of Star Trek for sure. Um, I think that they're doing and that they're running into the same problems that the Miles Morales did, and also the Tony Stark new person did too, where there's a fandom that has a specific idea of what star trek should be right forgetting how, that how kirk should be yeah. how spock should be mm -hmm. right yep and also too the fact that in star trek discovery the leader of that series was a black woman and there was a lot of uproar about that for right. sure um right. but also there were queer characters there non-binary characters there different relationships right. to humanity and also, too, what we haven't talked about, which you might not necessarily have time to talk about, the definition of Star Trek, or at least the arrangement of Star Trek that is existing now, is more connected to the environmental factors right. in our relationships with larger environments outside of what we traditionally consider to be human um, or sentient beings that look like or act like humans. Mm. Right? They were talking about mushrooms. They were talking about other types of relationships that we don't necessarily consider that wed our galaxy and what our universe and that's the type of thing that i think science fiction can help us see too is the everyday things that we take for granted right right the fact that there are underground networks of systems that exist between trees or mycelia and, right. and mushrooms yes. yes that 
yes. we have been trying to yes. emulate for years, but we don't say that, right? Right. Through the the web that we create um, right. online and all those different types of things. So it gives us the ability to express our reality in ways that's just distinct or different enough or divorced enough from it in order to have conversations that we'd be uncomfortable with having well, um, it, in our day-to-day -day lives. It's not to, to go back to Marvel comics, but I will. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, a lot of like the, I brought up the Miles, Miles Morales example for mm -hmm. a reason, because in all of the, in a lot of these recent movies that Marvel's come out with, a lot of it has to do with the multiverse, right? Yeah. And the interesting thing about the multiverse is that it gives people a lens into how things can be the same yet different, mm, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just a, a different way of imagining something. You know, yeah. um, Marvel's What If series is a different way of, of imagining something, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so, you know, it, it seems to me that it kind of fits in nicely to at least futurism, if not Afrofuturism, I guess mm -hmm. it depends on who it is and, and who's telling the story. Um, but to me, that that is interesting. The the you know, and I resisted it for a long time. Um, but then I saw, I forgot which one I saw, but it just it just I I got it. I got yeah. how you could what you can get kind of get out of it, right? Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm not really I can't I'm not a science fiction person. Yeah. In the in the I was a science fiction person when I was growing up. Okay. And then I. Then I got grown, and then all you know, yeah, just went out the out the window. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that um, Nolan, all of his movies I love, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and Interstellar. Yeah, That's to me, collective. again, it's it's about kind of how can you think about something different, right? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and how the, and, and this goes back to kind of science fiction writ large how can you like we live i did this i looked at this a, a couple of days ago because i was curious like how many stars how many how many galaxies are there right, right? Mm -hmm. they're like hundreds of millions of galaxies yeah right we are not the only ones around y'all yeah yeah yep yeah there are people I, who people things whatever to your point it could they could be sponges i mm -hmm. don't know Mm -hmm. But there are intelligent life forms in yeah. other places besides here. Yep. And the, the beauty of science fiction is it gets us to think about that. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're not the only ones um, in a way that we we generally don't because yeah. we are, you know, because we're here. Right. And this is our reality. Yeah, I think. I appreciate that for a lot of reasons. One is because it gets us to think outside of ourselves, right? It gets us to yes. assume yes. we're not the center of the universe. Yes. Never were. And yes. it also with that orientation, we can have a different conversation, right? About what does exist. And two, the fact that not only are there different ways of seeing things, but there are layers that you might not be able to see on the surface, but with deeper dialogue and deeper digging you might be able to open up interstellar was another movie i was actually going to say outside of arrival um because the language wasn't only what we saw in arrival it was something like love yeah which yes is, is a yes. sometimes a dirty word yes. <laughs> depending on what circle yes. that you're in yes and it's it's fascinating to me to and I've, I've actually just funnily enough, I just had this conversation with a bunch of graduate students about organizations, and we were trying to figure out how to build out toolkits. Mm. Um, and I was like, and we we talked about love. I was like, is this the first time you're talking about love in the educational environment? Um, yes, for a lot of them. I was like, what does that mean? What what does that mean to you? And why do you think that is? And then we talked about how much time we actually spend in our different organizations. Sometimes a third of our life. Yes. And I say. What does it mean that you spend a third of your life in a place where you don't, where it's void or bereft of love? If you're a human being, mm. what does that mean? What would how, that mean for you? Yes. Yeah. How does, does it mean? impact you? How yes. does it impact you? And how does that impact what you think is possible? Yes. And I think that that is part of what science fiction, and that's part of the reason why I loved Interstellar, not only because of 
the fact that there was time time travel and different dimensional thinking, but also too, and people saw this as like like oh love and all the rest of stuff. But if we consider the fact that it is something that it has brought people together across generations, right? Across organizations, across time, when it seemingly people did not have a reason to connect, it can be something that's useful. So part of the reason you asked at the very beginning um, what I did, part of the reason why I think my job and other jobs of educators, no matter if you see yourself as a full-time educator or not, is that education is something where you can get in contact with or touch that mm. form of love, right? It's a mm -hmm. sacred thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we are to do the work of diversity across organizations, we have to have some form of love and connection and solidarity built into it, or else it's not going to be something that's durable or sustainable, right? There's a idea across cultures where, and this is, happens in the, the Western spaces outside of the West, where you plan for seven generations into the future. Mm -hmm. In order for that to be a reality, you have to find forms of connection like love that will enable you to do that, which is why movies like Interstellar and movies like Arrival hit with me and other spaces for science fiction, where you can talk about love in different ways, talk about forms of connection and solidarity in different ways that are meaningful and that don't automatically become off-putting to people for whom that word is not something that you that you discuss in the vantage point or with the perspective of organizational spaces and stuff right so I think that that's I'm I didn't even I didn't know that you were like into comic books and stuff that is that is oh yeah that is, yeah, dope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is dope yeah and I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. it's I wish you know, more people would be. you know at this level we're all kind of a little bit of renaissance right <laughs> true you know what I mean that's just true. that's just facts true right true. because you 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 have to be so um, and, and, you know, my first, my first, um, my introduction to science fiction was H.G. Wells, mm. mm -hmm. right? And I read all of his books and then, you know, I, 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 I just read a lot of stuff. First of all, I was always on punishment. So I always had a reason to read. <laughs> so I was reading all those books. Yeah. I mean, and I was a comic book. I mean, I had, you know, hundreds of comic books when I was growing up. Yeah. So yeah, it's but you know to to you know the what you're hearing is the um kind of the 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 child in me who mm. was drawn to science fiction and drawn to comic books because yeah. of the kind of um just to to close this all up to because of the kind of aspirational nature of it because yeah. of the 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 thinking outside of yourself way, you know, uh, uh, of being, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things that kind of introduce you to um, while you're kind of in, you know, wh whatever particular cultural, you know, uh, uh, group and, and neighborhood that you find yourselves in, you could, you could, you could imagine, yeah. you could imagine. Yep. And that's really it. You could imagine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And for a lot of and we didn't really get to this, but for a lot of people who are not in the mainstream, mm -hmm. right? People of color, queer people, um, whatever. Mm -hmm. It gives them an opportunity to think beyond what is yeah. to what could be, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't deep enough at tw 10 to, be, to, to have all of that, but... Yeah. That's what got me, that's what kept me reading and kept me coming back to it. I appreciate that. And I, I think you that's exactly right. Like, as I mentioned, like growing up in West Philly and like being a queer person, trying to figure out how, how do I make a space for myself? Yeah. You know, yeah. how do I imagine something outside yeah. Yeah. of myself? Yeah. And I think what you mentioned, you said that it brought you back to like the child and imagining. I think that that is another thing. I, we, we talked a little bit about love. I think that the idea of play mm. is crucial mm -hmm. for any type of adaptive process, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not you're in an organization, if you're in a community setting, because you play around with could, what could be, and you also allow yourself to ask questions that you would as a child, right? Not take for granted a, a wealth of knowledge of things or ways that you might've been doing before, but look at stuff with fresh eyes. And ask the childlike questions that enable you to kind of have that innovative kind of connection to something else. And I'm, I'm really, I appreciate actually that you you were willing to allow yourself to do that in this space. I mean, mm -hmm. not not everybody is, you know. And I think too, 
what you spoke to about seeing things differently, you mentioned in our previous conversation that I shared with students um, that you have to understand what an organization can bear. You also have to translate the different things yes. that the organization wants to that yes. organization. Yes. And in order for you to do that, you have to be able to imagine yourself outside of yourself. Yes. You to imagine the perspectives that other yes. people have. And it's not just trying to build out forms of empathy. It's actually what it means to be, you know? So that's part of the reason why I think it's a really nice, you're a dope dude. Um, it's a, <laughs> it's a well, really nice we... through line. It's a really nice we... through line between between those between those things. Yeah. We're going to end on that high note. Clayton Coleman, thank you so much for being a part of our show today, man. I had the best time. I had the best time, and I really appreciate your time that you have given to us today. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate it too. And to our audience, thank you for, for listening, watching today. We look forward to continuing the discussion and keeping it going. Until the next time, take care.